How do we navigate French poetry in the context of song? This session is all about helping you find your way through the key features of French poetry using examples from the major poets and composers associated with the melody repertoire. So we're going to be drawing on poets like Verlaine and Baudelaire and Hugo, whose manuscripts you can see here, and composers like Debussy and Duparc and Forêt, who've also got some manuscripts on your screen. These were the kind of ways in which poetry and song compositions were circulating in the 19th century. Handwritten forms that then entered uh, people's reading habits and uh, salons for performance. Obviously there was print as well, but very often the poems and the music were circulating mostly orally between friends who were both poets and composers and artists and hosts and hostesses who liked to share the wonders of fabulous poetic language with fabulous musical language. But when we, from the perspective of today, try and navigate French poetry, particularly those of us who are not native speakers of French, it can be helpful to think about some of the features that serve the interpretation. And after today's session, uh, you may find it helpful to go and explore some of these resources, a couple of books and some websites that are tailored mostly towards uh, singers and performers preparing to uh, put French song on stage, if you like, but also really useful for audiences interested in learning more. So some of the basics or core tenets of French poetry that's really important to understand is that the way it is structured and the way the language uh, is structured uh, is largely without stress, as in it is mostly syllabic um, without heavy accents at any point in the poetic line. And very often it means you can just count the number of syllables that are available. So there isn't this idea of word stresses that we might have in, say, English language poetry or even German language poetry. So there's no kind of metrical foot in which you've got to fit a certain metrical or rhythmical pattern. In French poetry, it is all about much more evenly weighted syllables. So if we just take this line from Armand Silvestre's poem, Notre amour est chose légère, which you might know in the forêt setting, for example, we can just count that as eight syllables. Notre amour est chose légère. That's all it is. And when we speak the line, we don't try and put any emphasis anywhere particular, just Notre amour est chose légère. Uh, so we're not trying to go, notre amour est chose légère. We're trying not to put any kind of extra emphasis in the line. Just much more kind of evenly weighted. In French poetry, there are a number of expectations and conventions around how many syllables you should have in a line, how formal or informal that makes it, how musical or unmusical it makes it, and what we can do as we breathe and speak it, and of course then how we might sing it. So the most uh, established and respected verse line in French is the Alexandrine with 12 syllables in it. And this would be for usually for poetic content that's quite serious, that's quite uh, highbrow, that's quite significant. Um, they might use this as much for kind of epic drama as they would for a poem about love. And typically in the Alexandrian line, because it's quite a long line, there's usually a break halfway through, just a gentle kind of metrical accent, as we call it, on the sixth syllable, which isn't some big lump, but it is just a little uh, pause or marker in the line that there's a little halfway point. We've also got the decasyllable. Um, this has a slightly more flexible grouping, usually in sixes and fours, whichever way around people like to do it. But there is also a version of the decasyllable which splits five and five. It's known as the tara tantara rhythm. Tara tantara, tara tantara. It gives this kind of popular song meter and it's used for that quite often. In Melody, uh, we'll encounter that, for example, in uh, Baudelaire's La Mort des Amants, which has been set by Debussy, amongst others. And then you've got the octosyllable, which is kind of almost the go-to line length, both for poets and composers. So if there's any sense of this being lyric or lyrical poetry, where lyric 
and lyrical implies some kind of musical, emotional outpouring. It's the most flexible rhythmically. There are no fixed accents. There's no expectation that you should breathe at the halfway point or anything like that. Um, so you'll find a lot of songs will use the octosyllable. But then there's a whole uh, section of the repertoire that, that alternates meter, what we call heterometric. So combining lines of five and seven, seven syllables, for example, we find that in um, du Parc setting of Baudelaire's L'Invitation Voyage, for example. And that kind of, you know, shifting between line lengths gives a sort of a lilt to the text. And you can see composers really benefiting from that. It's sort of got a musical hint to it, but composers really exploit those kind of different line lengths um, to good effect. And uh, we should reserve a little note for the fact that usually French poetry traditionally would privilege even numbered lines, the eights, the tens and the twelves. But the odd numbered line is uh, clearly marked as slightly less conventional. So it draws the readers or the listeners attention. And also it is marked as more musical. Um, so by the time we get to Verlaine's poetry in the second half of the 19th century, uh, he expressly says, de la musique avant toute chose, music above everything else, and for that, let's have the odd numbered line length. He kind of almost uh, promotes it, if you like, and a lot of the arrière oublié, um, set by Debussy, but also some by Faure, um, use the seven-syllable line. So lots of options, but they each give us a little indicator about how important, how, how, how highbrow, how musical, how lyrical they are. And being aware of that can really help you interpret the song. Two aspects that uh, singers can be a little bit nervous around is a particular sound, the vowel sound of the mute E or the schwa, as it's sometimes described, the sound that's sort of fairly neutral, uh, sound. Um, most or a lot of French words end with a syllable or a sound that is constructed on an E that is somehow silent. So um, you might know the phrase je t'aime, I love you, it ends with an E that isn't normally pronounced in spoken French. But in poetry that silent E, that mute E at the end of the word, can get pronounced. There are certain rules around that. One is if the next word starts with a consonant. So the example I put in the middle of the slide here is je t'aime toujours, where you get that syllable e pronounced because it's followed by a consonant in poetry, ends up being five syllables. However, if the next word uh, starts with a vowel, you don't pronounce it. So uh, je t'aime encore, famous Celine Dion song, for those of you who are familiar with that repertoire, that just remains as four syllables, as it would be in spoken language. But in poetic language, another thing happens, which is uh, at the end of a line, if that phrase was at the end of the line, you wouldn't pronounce that mute E. However, when composers set that to music, and this is a very long standing convention, it's nothing unusual, uh, that mute E at the end of the line does get pronounced. So it's a particular scenario. So um, you might hear, je t'aime encore, sorry, je t'aime encore uh, in sung uh, melody, for example because it sits at the end of the line and is set to music. What we know about this is that singers are not very familiar with the sound, the uh sound, and precisely how to form it, where it is. And I always describe it as the most neutral, sort of uh in there, yeah? As if you're just kind of relaxing and being a bit fed up. Uh. Um, composers have usually done the work for you. They've usually written out a separate note uh, for that mute E. But really helpful is to understand that the amount to which it needs to be pronounced is not that much. So it might be there, it might have a note, um, but look at how it's phrased, look at where it sits in the line, and listen to how a number of French singers do it. Very often they'll tail off, they won't give it the full note value, they'll use a softer dynamic towards the end of, of, of that syllable. Um, just really much more kind of subtle use of that vowel. Um, it counts, it's there, but let's be light and um, less emphatic about that vowel. And then the other aspect that singers get particularly uh, concerned about if they're not native French speakers is what to do with the R in French. And you'll hear lots of variants across different kinds of singers. So the advice I normally give is just to use a single flip. Uh, some might call it a sim single tap. Something as if you were perhaps saying the word very in English, yeah? Uh, 
um, with that R in the middle, that sort of uh, sound in the middle. Um, you can also do it where it's just the start of a roll, almost where you put your tongue, almost as if you're about to do a D or a T, uh, but only one tiny bit of it, not too much of a roll, not too Italianate. Whereas in spoken French or in the kind of the chanson repertoire, people like Edith Piaf or Serge Gainsbourg, you might hear that much more kind of rrr sound right at the back of the throat, the guttural throat. And it is important to note there isn't consensus, particularly in contemporary performance um, of, of French melody. So I just encourage people to spend time listening to different singers doing it. So you, the, the kind of the flip, the sort of the very kind of sound that you might hear. Nathalie Desailly and Philippe Jarouski do that all, pretty much all the time. So it's quite nice to tune into their R's. They give you a good example. It can be um, quite unfamiliar to us as singers initially, but it's it's a, a sound to get you know into your habit, if you like. Whereas Véronique Jans and Sandrine Pio tend to be a little bit more kind of lighter and Italianate about it, a little bit more rolled, uh, depending on which R they're using. So they're interesting because they use a lot more of the, the roll than, than we might be uh, inclined to. And then uh, famously, François Leroux was uh, one of the first singers to kind of introduce the much more guttural R. He did it in his role as Pelias, so Debussy's opera, um, accepting or taking the stance that that opera is supposed to be more like natural speech, natural language, that it's not supposed to be this kind of really highbrow, um, stylized French. Um, he got a lot of flack for it at the time, but you'll hear his his uh, song recordings. He he does use that guttural R, uh, much more throaty. Uh, just gives us an, a nice variety. But once we've got the nitty gritty of the numbers and the sounds, it's really important to put it all together in uh, the kind of the direction of the phrase, if you like. And um, a couple of pieces of advice I like to share with singers in particular is that in French we're usually heading towards the end of the line and that means not putting any kind of kick or bump at the start of the line. That can feel quite anti-intuitive to us if we're used to the English repertoire or the German repertoire which often will sort of launch the line with a good entry. Um, French tends not to, you have to sort of enter quite softly. And given what we've learnt hopefully around how French is syllabic and more evenly weighted in all its syllables rather than kind of with metrical feet that might sort of lump and bump in the line, we need to be as even as possible throughout the line. So what that means in practice is, is we're able to be really attentive to the direction of meaning, that, that usually it's heading towards the end of the phrase. And what I've just put here are three examples of you know some quatrains some four line stanzas where the punctuation really helps us um usually because the, the, the entire kind of four lines end with a full stop that it's all going right the way not just to the end of the line but right way to the end of the stanza um, and that can be really helpful for interpretation because it stops us kind of chopping up the verse and putting really odd kind of emphases that are not helpful um, in, in the interpretation of the song. So from Hugo's um, Mes vers fuiraient d'où effraient, for example, which you might know in the Reynaldo Hahn setting, Si mes vers avaient des ailes. Um, first of all, it's about um, not putting a lump on Mes vers, yeah, that doesn't matter, but Mes vers fuiraient d'où effraient vers votre jardin si beau. And we might sort of head there, yeah, to beau, yeah. Um, particularly bearing in mind that the word ver means in, you know, in the direction of, yeah? But we can carry on because it's only a comma there. We can carry on. Si mes vers avaient des ailes comme l'oiseau. And that's where we put our kind of puncture, if you like. That we're heading right the way through to the end of the stanza. Now, obviously a composer might do something slightly different with that. But being aware that that's how the stanza is constructed, that that's how the direction of the meaning is shaped, is really quite helpful for what decisions we might make when we sing it. Similarly, we might take Baudelaire's uh, La Vie Antérieure. This is, I think, the second stanza from that poem. Um, you might know the Duparc setting of this. Now, this is a challenging one because it's an Alexandrian, that kind of long line length. Uh, um, you know, just as, you know, singing all of those syllables in one phrase is hard enough, let alone the fact that the entire phrase, the entire sentence phrase, if you like, is four lines long and potentially longer. 
and they are joined together. So um, they're joined together, um, what we call syntactically, by relative pronouns. So um, it's and, you know, and other conjunctions. So you've got the which does this and it does that. So the ku and the e at the start of lines two and three are extending the meaning. Everything's being added on top. So j'ai longtemps habité sous de vastes portiques. Que les soleils marins teignaient de mille feux et que leurs grands piliers droits et majestueux rendaient pareil le soir aux grottes basaltiques. And we're heading right the way to the basaltique. Yeah? And that's where we finally kind of finish off the meaning, if you like. Um, and that's hard to achieve in a song, of course it is. Uh, and we have to be guided by what Dupac does. But there's something, uh, particularly in that last line of that stanza, that's, that's perhaps helpful to hear. Look at those two commas just either side of le soir, which means the evening. It's just a little aside. Baudelaire's just slipped it in there. It's not central to the meaning. It's just giving a little bit of colour. By the way, you know, that the time of day was evening. Yeah? Uh, but the sung line is something like le soir, and you feel like it's joined into the line. But in fact, le soir, we can use the comma to phrase it, to give meaning to it, and also give ourselves a breath if we want. And then the final little example there is from uh, Verlaine's Claire de Lune, which we know perhaps in the Forêt or the Duparc setting, uh, where we've got this kind of, um, uh, again, this direction where it's sort of, you keep on having to go beyond the end of the line to get any meaning to join up. Um, and a bit like the Baudelaire verse, you've got the que, the relative pronoun, the which, which is extending the meaning. And then we've got the e, the, the and further on in the third line, et dansant, et quasi triste. But crucially, et quasi, quasi, you can't sort of end on that, that has no meaning. You have to, it has to go with triste. And in some of the settings, you see that the composer's done that for you. Uh, so where they've done it for you, that's really helpful. Um, and we should be guided by that. We should we should think all the way through to triste sous leur déguisement fantasque. We get all the way to the end. So hopefully now we've got a sense that um, what the poets do and then what the composers do uh, differs slightly, but. Uh, what we then can do in our knowledge base, if you like, knowing what the poets are working on and then knowing what the composers are working on, is we can observe what goes on in the score. We can be really alert to that. So most composers, out of necessity, have to ignore what the line breaks do in the poetry. We often might get an indication of it by a phrase marking um, and a set of rests, for example, if the composers decided to give us that, but that's not always the case. Um, we might see capital letters introduced to signal the start of uh, a new poetic line that is irrelevant um, to the musical phrase almost. Um, but also we might find some of the punctuation is helpful. Now we just need to be aware that a composer um, might change the punctuation, but also their typesetter or their publisher might have done something different with the punctuation. And that's where it can be really, really helpful just to check back with the poem so you might go on to um, Oxford Leaders uh, website or you might go on to leader.net uh, but I'd also encourage you where possible and it is with most of the 19th century uh, French poets um, to go on a website called Gallica um, which has all pretty much all the first editions of uh, the poetry. You can go and find out what what did the poet actually mean to publish um, and that can be really helpful for shaping your own interpretation in relation to what the composer's been able to do. We have to be aware, of course, that composers cut stanzas out. Um, they might repeat sections of the text that weren't originally meant to be repeated. Um, and Faure, of all the composers, is particularly renowned for doing that. Um, so he will chop and change the text much more so than uh, a lot of the other melody uh, composers. And you also might just want to be attentive to what a composer's done with those mute E's that we were talking about at the ends of a line. So, for example, in Debussy, c'est l'extase from the Arrêt Oublié, the setting of Verlaine. You'll notice um, on the end of Amoureuse, where we've got the mute E pronounced, there is a separate note, uh, but it is tied in, if you like, to the whole phrase by that phrase marking. Um, and it is also on a slightly kind of descending trajectory. Uh, and, you know, a, a shorter note value in total than the previous syllable. So those are kind of some indications of what Debussy's done there. Or in Duparc's Chanson Triste, you get tendresse at the end of a line, 
where the mutie gets pronounced tendresseux, but notice that Dupac has just kept the same note. Um, so uh, either composers will often keep the same note or put it on a falling interval rather than a rising one. So he's kept the same note and he has made it a shorter note value. Yeah, that's also to give you a breath for the next phrase, but it's also an indication of how he doesn't want you to go to to go and sing tendresse, but tendresse, where you lighten off on tendresse, despite what the uh, dynamic marking seems to indicate. You need to lighten off on the uh sound at the end of the phrase. And then finally, for his Lydia there, um, we've got the phrase ravieux, and we've kind of got that combination where there's the entire phrase marking looping it in, and we've got the descending uh, note value, and we've got a diminuendo there. But notice how he hasn't shortened the note value. So he's written ravio, where the V and the O both have uh, minims. But he could, and I would probably usually encourage a singer, uh, he could have uh, written in a quaver rest there. Uh, I would probably encourage a singer to, to just lighten off and to, to allow yourself a bit more space there. Because that's a mutee. That's, you know, it's almost uh, expected that, that a foray that his singers might do that. So what I just thought I'd do for the final two, three minutes is just talk through a kind of a, a worked example of what, what, what you might go and do as a singer or a pianist or an audience member in, interested in getting to know more about French song. So I've chosen Debussy's Nuit d'Etoile, uh, which is one of his first songs, actually. Um, I think it was the first one that was ever published. Um, so quite an early Debussy song. And what I've done, I've just sort of assembled a bunch of materials. I've gone and checked the poem text. I've got a version of it from the Oxford Leader website. I haven't put up the translation, but you can find uh, Richard Stokes' translation on the Oxford Leader website if that's helpful to you. But then I've also gone and found the original source poem on the website Gallica. Uh, and I find that, well, I know it's a Bonville poem, but I find that the poem was published in 1846 uh, by Bonville. And it had a title that's different from Debussy's title. So the title is La Dernière Pensée de, de Weber, de Weber, depending on how you want to pronounce uh, the composer's surname. So that is the composer Karl Maria von Weber, uh, who wrote the opera Der Freischutz and who famously also wrote uh, Invitation to the Dance. Um, his music was really, really popular in France in the 1830s and 40s in particular. So the fact that Bonville was writing this in the 1840s is quite significant. Um, remember that Berlioz had um, done an orchestration of the Invitation to the Dance, so that music was really well known. So we have a poem written by a French poet which seems to be about uh, a composer, and yet Debussy has then taken out the composer's reference when he puts it into a song in Nuit d'Etoile. So I've done a bit of background work. And the other thing I've done in doing the background work and going to the first edition on Gallica is I've checked how the poem is laid out. And if you notice on the left hand side of the slide there, the poem is, is heterometric. It starts with two lines of three syllables, then a seven syllable line, two lines of three, then a seven syllable. And that actually forms the refrain of the poem. And I, for reasons of the space, I haven't repeated the refrain in between each of the verses, um, but that's uh, how it's laid out in the original uh, publication. Um, but then the verses are all eight syllables long. So it's quite an interesting kind of combination of meters. So we've got something quite lyrical and lilting. We've got the eight syllables, which are more associated with, with lyric poetry. And we've got the heterometric verse, which is more associated with kind of musical uh, features. And we know there's a reference to a composer. So um, I've also just pulled together a few other interesting ideas. Um, I've researched a little bit more around Bonville um, and uh, a really useful book by David Evans about uh, Bonville highlights how um, Bonville himself thinks of musicality as not this kind of, oh, three and seven syllables heterometric, therefore equals music, not the kind of the metrical qualities in and of themselves, but also how uh, poetic meaning constructs something that is more musical than not. Uh, so David Evans suggests this idea of the hazy veil of uncertainty and really emphasises how to be musical for Bonville means suggesting the half light. Um, and if you know Debussy's music, um, you'll know that they, those kind of colours and half colours are really, really prevalent in his writing. So I think there's something interesting around how Bonville is thinking about poetry and music in the way Debussy is. 
But Bonville himself, in the preface to that collection of poetry, writes that his, you know, poems in that book are sort of, you know, imitations of songs and that he was trying to express in poetry those kinds of sensation um, and those kinds of feeling that you could call musical. So I'm getting quite an interesting picture uh, from this, from, from understanding what the, the syllabic count's doing, so the metrical features of the verse, and then also just looking at um, the, the context for it and the meanings for it, the, sort of this half meaning, this half light, this kind of sensations and feelings. And the overall sensation of the, of the poem is the one that's referenced in the first full stanza, la sereine mélancolie, you know, a calm sadness. Um, and uh, we, we can sort of build up a picture of the text. And particularly if we then look at each verse and we see that they are, you know, as we've seen in other examples, they are an entire sentence in four lines. You know, so the direction, uh, we've got the, you know, the, the and this and that being added into a lot of these lines. So we can think of them as full kind of units, not la sereine mélancolie, vient éclore au fond de mon cœur, but it's this whole unit that goes together. And so I also try and look for different versions of the score. I've got a baritone version there um, from a 1910 edition. Um, I'll often, uh, where possible, particularly with Debussy songs, get different editions. So I've got a Dover edition and I've got a Hal Leonard edition, um, as well as uh, some of the other uh, manuscripts that you can find online. I just find that quite fun to compare, uh, see what picture I can build of it. And then finally, I'd usually um, pick out at least two recordings that will be useful for this. And I've suggested the Nathalie de Sailly and Philippe Cassard one for, record a classic, uh, for Warner Classics. Um, they've really maximised that idea of the lilt. You feel that kind of nuit d'étoile. And if you look at the YouTube version there, you'll see de Sailly when she's preparing it for recording also uses her hands to kind of gesture the direction of the text. I think it's a really, really useful example. Versus the Christopher Maltman and Malcolm Marsno version of it, um, which is more, I'm going to say stately, but it's more that it's the emphasis is more on the, the inner the inner melancholy, the kind of the calm melancholy, the serenity, um, much less of the lilt has come through uh, the song. And so we're understanding what the, you know, metrical stresses and structures of the poem are doing and what we can then do in the interpretation of it via Debussy. I hope that's been an interesting uh, mini tour through some of the key aspects of uh, French poetry in relation to song. Thanks for listening and take care.